I'm excited. This is wonderful. When you went away, I was like, oh. This is so juicy, it's great. So we really appreciate it. I want to pick your brain on every aspect of the gospel. So anyway, <coughs> but we will let you, if you want to do an intro or most everybody has seen you. And we the can last just... end of verse 19 in Daniel 8. At the time appointed, the end shall be. The Moedim is the discussion we're going to be having. This word that a time appointed is actually translated in the, um, from the, Hebrew, as, or the Hebrew word is moedim, or moed. That verse, or that, excuse me, that word means the time appointed. It also means several other things that the King James translators translated the word into. Because the, um, I actually just watched a video on the life of, uh, all of a sudden I'm having that brain moment, um, Tyndale, who translated the King James. Tyndale. William Tyndale, and he felt like when he did the translation, it was okay to, to substitute synonyms for the same words often. So he would sometimes take the Hebrew word and translate it this way, and sometimes this way, and sometimes this way, just for flair and for readability, which is all fine and dandy, but the problem with that approach is sometimes we don't get the core meaning of the word. So I'm going to get into the core meaning of Moedim um, very much because it's very pertinent to understanding. I'm <laughs> getting clumsy in my old age. Um, uh, anyway, it's very pertinent to understanding prophecy. And you're going to go, why? What does that matter? Well, we're going to talk about it very, very keenly now because we're going to go into a very in-depth study of the Moedim, which in Leviticus... Everybody knows is this almost taboo thing you talk about in Mormondom on, and all Christian religions of the feasts. We sometimes think the feasts are some crazy ritual that don't mean anything. But I tend to be one who understands God does never command anything that doesn't mean something. However, that doesn't mean we're to observe them since Christ fulfilled portions thereof. So what we need to do is do exactly what the scriptures say, and that is understand what the point was. Why did he give the Feast of Passover? Why did he give you know, um, Sukkot, which is Pentecost? Why did he give trumpets? Why did he give Day of Atonement? What's the reason God did that? It wasn't just random. Okay, They are all referred to as the Moedim. So, to understand the Moedim is to understand prophecy. If you understand what that means and why God gave them to us, what he's really doing for us is giving us his appointments with the earth. And you say, well, well, what do you mean? Well, when he first came, he fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. He fulfilled those festivals precisely. What would we know them as? the crucifixion, his time in the spirit world, and his resurrection. Okay? Okay? And I'm just going to give you that much. Um, but so what I'm saying here is these things, particularly um, this day here, first fruits, and this day, are both major resurrection points. Sure. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Okay, <clears throat> um, so those, I'm, those are our Greek, Greek names or he, English names for them. The Hebrew names would not be, it would be Pesach, uh, Unleavened Bread. This, I'm trying to remember the Hebrew name. This was like uh, um, Sukkot. Yeah, Sukkot. And this would be um, in regards to it, and I'm trying to remember. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Any, that's this one, Rosh Hashanah. Anyway, so the Hebrew names are different than the, than our names, but I give you these names because that's what we're familiar with, kind of. And I say kind of because we really kind of don't pay attention to them. How many ever, ever track what day Passover is or what day um, First Fruits is or Pentecost or any of those days? You just don't see them in our culture. No. You just don't. But we really should because it's a rehearsal of timing. I'm going to show you that in very big detail. 
and particularly that first fruits day, you've got to understand that that is the day after the Sabbath, just like the resurrection was. It's the day after the weekly Sabbath. And if Passover is on a Friday, that would fall Monday. But let's say, just for instance, your birthday is not always on a Friday. Your birthday falls on every day of the week sometimes. But let's say if Passover was on a Monday, first fruits would be a week later after the week, weekly Sabbath. You see that? It'd be seven days later. Did everybody catch with me on that? Huh? Okay, I want to be clear. Because if Passover happened to have landed on a Monday, the day after the weekly Sabbath wouldn't be for seven days, a week later on Monday. Whereas at the year of his crucifixion, Passover la and landed on a Friday, and it was the third day. So on the road to Emmaus, first fruits was the day of the resurrection. On the road to Emmaus, this was the third day since it, all these things were done. That's what it says on the road to Emmaus. So, so in essence, this day of first fruits becomes very important because particularly when Passover is on a Monday, and it's seven days later, that's on the seventh day of unleavened bread, which is a double whammy. It's a high Sabbath. And it's first fruits, and it's the last day of unleavened bread. All those factors come together, and I'm going to show you more later. I probably shouldn't get too distracted with that yet. So who decided that Sunday was going to be the new Sabbath instead of the Monday? Oh, well, I confused by the Sabbath. Okay, okay. let me clear that up. Nobody did. Okay, but the Christians, the early, I say the early Christians, at Constantine's establishment of our new religion, I'm going to call it a new religion, okay, at Constantine's establishment, what he was really doing is a politician's work. He had all these Christians in his empire that had become so prevalent and so much of a problem that he, he had to decide what to do because as it was going, he had a collision heading in his kingdom. And so he had all these pagans. And by the way, at that time, forgive, this is going to be a little sidetrack, but I'm trying to answer your question. The Romans implemented an eight-day week for 300 years. They had the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then what they called market day. Okay, and that day was put in the week so that they had a day to go do their, their market store stuff. And that market day, and the Romans ran an eight-day week for, I think, two or three hundred years. And so when Constantine got to that point, he had the Christians doing a seven-day week. He had the pagans doing an eight-day week. And the Christians were a force he couldn't reconcile with because they were willing to die for what they believed in. And so that's kind of a messy situation for a leader. And so he had a, quote, quote, conversion to Christianity. And what he did is he took the pagan holidays and he blended them with the Christian holidays and tried to make peace in the kingdom. You don't happen to have a tissue. I got a... <clears throat> so I can't remember the... At the Narcian Creed, they got them all together. But they made December 25th, Christmas, his birth. They made um, Easter on Easter Sunday, which was deliberately scheduled to never land on Passover and never land on First Fruits. Deliberately, it was all pagan, and the, the goddess to stare was the god of fertility that they, they would take, sacrifice babies and take their blood and dye the eggs red. Okay, so what I'm saying is he deliberately took all these pagan, awful traditions and combined them with the Christian traditions to get peace in the land, and he took the eight-day week and made it a seven-day week. And his purpose in that was to get peace in the kingdom, but in the process he also wanted to get rid of what I would like to say is the true Christians. It always seems to want to pick on the really true people. That's what the goal seems to be in the long fall, haul anyway. But in that process of all that, it's, if you take the common denominator of eight and seven, eight times seven is 56. So every 56 days, the, the pagan 
sun god worship day, and the Christian Sabbath would land together. So he waited until those two became one, and he proclaimed a seven-day week. So the, the purpose of that was to satisfy the kingdom, in essence. It was political, mostly. So that being said, the weekly Sabbath was always Sunday. And the, and the Jews have it off. And I can prove that with DNC section 59. If you read DNC section 59, you'll read that this is the day of your, your offerings and your meaning your Sabbath. This is the Sabbath day, and that revelation was given on Sunday. When you track it back, it was a Sunday. So Joseph Smith didn't fix the Sabbath because it wasn't broken. It's the only thing that we got handed down that almost wasn't broken in all this tradition that got handed down. Yep, and if you take the Jews, they really start their Sabbath on Friday, which is the sixth day, not the seventh, <laughs> in their calendar, or our calendar, however you want to. So when, when Hillel II, at Constantine's time, he made a public statement, he didn't want the Jewish Sabbath to be on the Christian Sabbath, and he moved it right before. And it's documented history that nobody knows, because nobody looks because they don't think they need to. But the truth is, they start their Sabbath on the eve of Friday, which is the sixth day by our calendar. We actually should be starting our Sabbath on the eve of Saturday, which is the seventh day. Okay, it's just, you gotta, if, if it's gonna be the eve instead of midnight, you gotta go one way or the other. You either gotta go forward or back. So the Sabbath actually starts Saturday evening with the setting of the sun. Just so you know. No, um, that is a that is a theory. Well, let's put it this way: you'll never get me to buy onto that. <laughs> okay, okay, because it's an unbroken chain of sevens, and if you were to use the lunar to start the Sabbath, you would have to break it. I have such an itchy nose. <clears throat> I get hay fever this time of year, and I've been working on an excavator, and that has a tendency to make my nose itch. <laughs> so anyway, so just understand that that theory, well, thank you. Anyway, um, that theory that they reset by the lunar cycle means that you'd have a 28-day, and every month you would have the seven-day cycle getting broken. That's not anywhere else in scripture. So there's nothing to set that as a precedence. Um, and it also would throw a lot of things that wouldn't work scripturally and mathematically off. Whereas they do now. If you just compute it right, it all lands perfectly. Um, and I love math, as you can see. So I'm kind of sorry I took that rabbit trail, but it's probably important that you can follow me, that this day of first fruits is the day after the Sabbath, always commanded in Leviticus. It's the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So if Passover, if Passover is any day during the week, it's still the following Monday morning, or Sunday evening, actually, technically, eve to morning. It would be Sunday evening, would always be the beginning of the first fruit celebration. And he was actually resurrected before dawn early Monday morning. That's actually, a, gives you your three days and three nights exactly. And the reason they didn't understand that is they wiped away the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a high Sabbath. So the Moedim, the word Moedim, or the, the appointed times is God's day planner. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, it is what he revealed to us through Moses to tell us his appointments with the earth. And you're going to go, really? He has appointments with the earth? Why wouldn't he? And why wouldn't he give them to us? Okay, because it's, it's one of those things he's saying, hey, okay, celebrate Passover for 1,500 years. Why? So that you know when this guy's put up on the cross and he says it is finished and then he's risen on the third day, 
early in the morning, that that's paralleling what I showed you, the pattern I showed you, another witness of Jesus Christ. So these are his day planner. These are the times he will fulfill different prophetic pictures. Um, this was his first coming. However, it's going to have another fulfillment right here at First Fruits, a big one. And then it's going to have another big one at Pentecost. And Passover on the year of this fulfillment just so happens to be April 6th. Okay? Fascinating trivia. I think find very fascinating. Um, and what I'm going to do here, i got to tell you, in reality, um, what I'm going to tell you today is very bold. And you've got to understand, I'm sticking my neck way out on the line. And you're going to go, hmm, do I really believe this guy? Well, I'll, you'll, you'll make that decision for yourself. So the Passover was absolutely fulfilled perfectly at his crucifixion and resurrection. Gethsemane, crucifixion, and then resurrection. <clears throat> Did I go too fast? Um, okay. Um, so the Moedim, also translated as feasts, also translated as appointed times of the Lord, are the rehearsals of the end. And you're going to go, wow. That's a pretty bold statement. That means that the fulfillment of these whole high holy days are going to be fulfilled precisely on the high holy days. So what I'm saying is this first half of those things were fulfilled precisely at his first coming. It's all going to be cyclical. It's all going to happen again. <clears throat> so these are what we need to understand. To understand the Moedim is to understand prophecy. To understand Dun Daniel's numbers require us to understand the Moedim. The Moedim is God's day planner. The Passover Moed, Moed was perfectly fulfilled in Christ, and the Moedim, the Feast of the Lord, are the rehearsals of the end. So, what they were doing in ancient Israel was rehearsing what's going to happen. That's pretty bold. Now, in a, anybody familiar with Blue Letter Bible? A few? I love Blue Letter Bible, by the way. I, it's the work done by some really, I'm really grateful to the scholarship that they put into this. What this is is a website you can go to called Blue Letter Bible, and you can take the uh, scripture you're looking at right there, say Daniel 819, which is the title of my presentation here today, and you can, uh, maybe, um, there you go, you can put it in the search bar, and you can hit search, and it'll pull up the reference. But what's really cool is once you pull up the reference of, in Blue Letter Bible, that brings it up right there. You can click on that reference right there, click your mouse, and it's going to take you to a breakdown of the verse, and it's going to show you the Hebrew. At the time appointed, the Hebrew word is moed. So I can use this blue letter Bible to go through the whole entire Old Testament. Now I could click on that moed verse, right there, and it's going to bring me up every place in Scripture that references Moed. Actually, it's that what you click right there, that, that reference right there. So when that happens, <clears throat> it's going to bring up the word Moed. And if you click here, it'll pronounce it for you. And then it's going to go through here, and it's going to show you how it's been translated through the Old Testament in all the different ways. So it's a solemn, solemn assemblies. The Moed is solemn assemblies. Okay, the Moed is solemn assemblies at the temple, at the ancient temple. Okay, these Moed, this Moedim, is the appointments that God made with ancient Israel. Okay, and I say ancient kind of carefully because it's for us too. 
Okay, then you can go down and you can see all the ways it's translated and how many times it was translated. It's translated as synagogue, the two. But this particular synagogue is kind of a poor translation because it's really temple. Okay, it's temple the typology. So you got all these different ways it's translated and you got these are the words. The tent of the meeting. What was the ancient tent of the meeting? Tabernacle in the wilderness. The tent of the meeting. The tent of the meeting with God. Well, I'm temple, but... Same thing. The ancient tabernacle was a temple for them at that time. And when did they go meet God in the temple? In the Holy of Holies? When did they go there, though? On the Holy Days, but particularly one. On one Holy Day, a year, they were able to go meet him, and that was actually... The Day of Atonement. Okay? <clears throat> and that's the only day the high priest was allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. That would have been the day that Zechariah went into the Holy of Holies and when the angel came to him. Well, no, that's at his death. But, okay, but he, when Zechariah went into the Holy of Holies and was told that John would be born. Okay? When he would, that he would be born to them. Okay, because he, he got the short stick that time because what they would do is the, the different priests would get an opportunity to all get that opportunity at, by lot. So you're it's like, one day was the Day of Atonement? Yep, that's the day when they were allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. And that's the day when the angel came to Zechariah and says, you will have a son, and he was made deaf because he doubted to begin with. <clears throat> okay, so then if you click on that, you can actually see every verse that has this moed in it tr translated in the way it was translated. Like in this time, it's in Daniel 8, 19, it's translated as appointed time. In this time, it's appointed time. So it's actually translated as an appointed time or an appointed assembly more then it's translated as feast. The word is actually more often translated differently than it is feast. So I often think that feast is a very poor translation because it gives us the impression it's some kind of ritual that was done away. Okay, and truthfully, the observance of the ritual was upgraded, so to speak. But the ritual wasn't done away. Okay, we just don't understand exactly what that was. And if that was to go on, you'd just see it go on the list of all the references in the Bible that have Moed in it. Okay, Lamentations, Jeremiah. And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He hath destroyed his place of assembly. Did that happen to the ancient temple? Okay, it was violently taken away his tabernacle. He destroyed the place of his sanctuary. The Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. Now, is that a prophetic or what? Did we forget in all of Christianity these things? Not just us, not just by the design of the Catholic Church. We lost track of the Moed. He hath despised the indignation of his anger the kings and the priests. The Lord hath cast off his altar. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. He hath given up into the hands of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of the solemn feast. So he's telling us in Lamentations, he's prophesying that the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD and that all this would basically be forgotten on purpose. Hmm. That word, his place of assembly, maybe. <laughs> that word in the translation here is the same word that we're talking about here. It's the moed, the place of the moed. What's the place of the moed? Well, this one he's talking about is Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That is the place of the moed. That's the place we're talking about. And the day of solemn Moed would be the high days we're talking about. 
So it's been taken from Zion. It's been forgotten in Zion in a way by design because we live in the time of the Gentiles. And we weren't to necessarily understand this, according to Daniel, until the time of the end. Okay, these things we weren't supposed to get yet. And I'll show you more in the quotes. So that could have also been translated as the place of the feasts and the day of the solemn feasts. Well, what's the only place Israel celebrated their feasts? Temple Mount, Jerusalem. <clears throat> So when Jesus came the first time, Nephi knew 600 years before it happened. We have that given to us in the Book of Mormon. Daniel knew about 550 years before it happened to the day by prophetic utterance. Samuel, the Lamanite, knew five years before. Okay, so this thing of knowing when Christ was come, they kind of knew. Anybody that was paying attention. And you know what? The Jews knew too. The Jews were expecting the Messiah. And then when Jesus came, they're like, you're not what we expected. We expected this conqueror to deliver us from the Romans. And so they got all worked up. And because he wasn't up to their expectations, they actually fulfilled God's word and crucified him, which is kind of... I call it, I think I did last time even, checkmate. Okay? He used a checkmate to fulfill the prophetic picture so that the atonement could happen. And it had, it's a scary thought, but it had to be by those who were appointed to offer him. That's kind of a scary thought. Um, <clears throat> you know, that it's the appointed ones that fulfilled his crucifixion. So just, just keep in mind that pictures don't always get fulfilled the way we see them. It's sometimes different than we see them. So this Daniel's Hour of Judgment, which you're going to see this chart and go, okay. um, this chart that, that structurally I put together based on Daniel's numbers, um, this chart that I'm showing you, which has all these prophetic pictures coming together, it refers to the time I referred to last week, this hour which is this from here to here, of the hour of judgment. Okay, this chart that we're talking about, I'm going to go into in great detail today. And I'm going to kind of show you the math. Which when I show you the math, it's going to be pretty bold. I got to tell you, because the math only works one time in all of the studies I've done. One time in our future that on all the studies I've done. Okay? <clears throat> so, Joseph Smith, and the quote every Christian minister will quote, and you'll hear most people quote him, and in one sense, we've seen it repeated just over and over again, is Matthew 24, mostly verse 36, but let's go with 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But the Day and the hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What are we referring to? The second coming. The second coming. No man know the day or the hour, okay? Um, so that, that phrase right there, no man know the day or the hour, just so you know, one of the high days is referred to as the day and the hour no man knoweth. Really? Okay? Oh. <laughs> okay, and that's trumpets. Why don't they know? Because it's a witnessed event. You can't know until you see it. Okay? It's when the sighting of the seventh month moon is in the western horizon. And they can't know it until they see it, especially in their day. Because they didn't have things like Starry Night Pro, where you can actually compute the probable day of the day and the hour no man knoweth. Okay? <clears throat> so you'd say, oh, Pharaoh, you're going into deep water. And I am. I'm going into deep water. <laughs> but I have good company. Okay? And that's the prophet Joseph Smith. Okay? He actually made this statement, and I just, my mind, my hair blew back when I read the statement. Christ says, no man knoweth the day or the hour. 
when the Son of Man cometh, Matthew 24, 36. Did Christ speak in general principle throughout all generations? Oh no, he spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living knew the day or the hour. But he did not say, no man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. So he's saying, sometime we're in the future we're going to know. For This would be a flat contradiction with other scriptures. For the prophet Amos says that God will do nothing, but he will reveal it unto his servants, the prophets. Now, in our culture, prophets are way out there. Okay? In our culture, prophets are way out there. We don't, hardly any of us, intermingle on a day-to-day -day basis with the prophet or the prophets, right? So you're kind of like, well, he hasn't said anything. Actually, Spencer Kimball, let me go back. Spencer Kimball actually said that they wouldn't say anything. I can't remember the quote, but I need to find it so I can show it to you. But he actually said they wouldn't. <clears throat> say anything because it was became more our responsibility and that's where I'm going with this next scripture Joseph Smith quotes any man that does not receive revelation for himself must be damned for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy for Christ says ask and ye shall receive and if, hap and if ye happen to receive something ask will it not be a revelation in this this is kind of a a personal indictment to each and every one of us that we all need to get the spirit of prophecy and that we all need to take personal responsibility for where we are. Um, so the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going out on thin ice, you might say, but I don't consider it thin ice because I know what the Lord gave me. Um, at the same time, I don't take any glory in myself over it. I simply am going to share with you what he shared with me. And when I ask him, well, why did you share this with me? Do you know what his answer was? You ask. You ask. <laughs> it's exactly what he told me. And so it's okay, because we always get this, you're not, you shouldn't ask. It's evil to it's, ask. He actually, do you know that almost every revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants came from Joseph Smith asking a question? Okay, he asked a question, and that's all I did is I asked, I said, you know, I don't know this Daniel's number. You know, he's patient, though. It took 12 years to answer that question for me. Almost 12 years, so probably 10, 11, I'm guessing, but exactly when she gave me that program and I started on this journey. So that's the simple, you, you said it precisely. <laughs> you ask. He didn't say it's because I'm anything special. He just says, you asked. DNC, when I, going back a little, I appreciate uh, Andrew Ehat. When I taught Andrew Ehat in a fireside similar to this, which it's hard to believe I taught Andrew Ehat, he should be teaching me. Oh, he's amazing. He's <laughs> okay. taught us numerous times. Anyway, and he, well, he did teach us at that same weekend gathering where he taught and different ones of us taught. But when I taught my last week of Christ um, presentation at that gathering with Andrew Ehat, he added this scripture to what I was saying, and I thought, oh, how beautiful. Um, <clears throat> if there be bounds set to heavens or the seas or to the dry lands or to the sun or the moon, the stars, all the times of their revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, I could just use the Hebrew and say all the Moed. Okay, right there. This is DNC 121, Joseph Smith. All those days, months, and years, the days, months, and years, and all their glories, laws, and set times shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of time. So, Joseph Smith was saying, it's going to happen. These things are going to be revealed. Okay, Daniel 12. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That scripture is basically saying... Hey, Daniel, I get it. I just gave you a, a total vision and prophecy, but guess what? You don't get to understand it. That's kind of a cheat, isn't it? You give me this, here I am a prophet, and you give me this vision, and you won't tell me what it means. That's kind of not fair, right? 
And so, but he says, even to the time of the end, and many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So he's saying, hey, they're not going to get this till the time of the end. This vision you showed us. Has knowledge been increased? I, I kind of went through this, I think, last time. But are we in a position where I can sit in my office and I can study the libraries of the world? Yes. It's a beautiful thing, and yet it's a dangerous thing all at the same time. Everything is available. All of man's knowledge is out there. And a good lot of God's knowledge is on there. A good lot of Satan's knowledge is on there. I mean, everything's on there. I actually, the first time I got introduced to the Internet, the guy that was introducing me says, you can find anything on the Internet. And I thought, yeah. And he says, yeah, anything. Up and down the spectrum. Knowledge is definitely increased in our day. Now, I wouldn't say wisdom is very much, but knowledge is. And we bounce off of it and waste it on stupidity, most of us. <clears throat> and I heard, this is a few verses later, and I heard but understood not. So we're saying that Daniel, being the prophet of the Lord, didn't even understand his own vision. That's a pretty hard thing. Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he says, go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So he's basically saying, Daniel, I'm sorry, you're just not going to get it. Um, Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw this out. Let's just assume as a premise that maybe my ideas I'm about to present are right. That would only lend to the fact that it must be. Okay. In other words, if he, if he truly has showed this in our day, it must be the time of the end. Okay, so, back to the original scripture that I was the head of my lesson, or my head of my presentation. And he said, Behold, I will make thee known what shall be the last end of indignation. The end of indignation. Ooh, that's not a fun time. For at the time appointed, the end shall be at the... The Moed in the Hebrew. At the Point. feast, the end shall be. I didn't say it. That's why I'm comfortable saying it. It's because this is scripture. Okay, I'm just enlightening scripture to your mind. I'm helping you see a view of scripture you've maybe never been able to see before because it's been withheld until now. Genesis, the story of Abraham and Isaac, is a parallel of the father and the son. Have you ever seen that in parallel and understood it? That Abraham being a type and shadow of the father, offering his son's sacrifice as a type of the son, Isaac, is a type of the father and the son. Is there anything too hard? This is the story when the Lord told Abraham he would have his son. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So at the Moed, I will return to thee. When was Christ born? At the Moed. Time he was supposed to come. <laughs> but, but literally, he was born exactly, well, on the Hebrew calendar, exactly 33 years and four days from the time he was crucified on the triumphal entry day. The same day in the Hebrew cyclical pattern that was a triumphal entry. How do we know that? Book of Mormon, the sign of his death. And it had been the 33rd year had passed, and we're in the first month and the fourth day of the 34th year. So 33 years and four days. First month, four days. So he was literally on the Hebrew calendar, crucified 33 years and four days after his birthday. Whole nother presentation, Star Bethlehem. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, where it shows how that just perfectly lines up with the Book of Mormon and all scripture. 
and shows you that he was actually born on the 10th day of Nisan, which was in the year of his birth, the eve of April 5th and the day of April 6th. <laughs> okay. It's really beautiful. When you find out that God really means what he says and says what he means, and he fulfills it exactly according to his patterns, according to his scriptures, you start to get a feeling, oh man, I can really trust these scriptures. They're pretty accurate. <laughs> but there's been changes in that. I, I kind of appreciate that you're using the stars more than the Hebrew calendar, because the Hebrew calendar has shifted, right? They, from the ancient time. Okay, let me answer that. The answer is yes, it has, deliberately, but mostly the beginning change took place when they were captive in Babylon, okay, and they had to come up with another way to keep their high days rather than the sighting of the new moon from the temple in Jerusalem, because they weren't in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, and so they come up with a mathematical formula, and then it was revamped and revamped and revamped. And so the current Hebrew calendar is a mathematical calculation, not a sighting-based calendar like it's supposed to be. So when you, and I've done this with my family many times, because on my phone I have an app that shows me their Hebrew calendar day. And often I will take my family out on what they say is a particular day, like the 29th day of the previous month, and I'll go out and show them the sighting of the new moon, and I'll show, see, the calendar's off a day, or this time it's off two days, or whatever. I've actually done that with my family on several occasions that they might know that the Hebrew uh, rabbinical traditional dates are not the way it was commanded in Scripture. I could go farther with that. The year in their dates is off because, remember I told you that Daniel prophesied of his atonement to the day over 500 years before it happened and it's 490 years from the decree of Artaxerxes. They knew that too. And in about 70 to 90 AD, they didn't know what to do with it because it didn't get fulfilled the way they said unless Christ was the Messiah. And Christ can't be the Messiah because we killed him. You know, that can't be good. Okay, so, so the rabbi who gained momentum and created the doctrine of what the year was, erased a bunch of years and made it from temple destruction to temple destruction, Daniel's prophecies. And he robbed 160 years at that moment out of the Hebrew calendar and made Darius, Artaxerxes, and Cyrus all the same person. And erased all those years. Wow. Proven, documented. And yet, they still go with their crazy numbers. So when you see the year, which is 5,781 or something, I can't remember what it is. Okay, exactly, I think that's right, 81. But when you see those years, you just gotta understand, you can trace that they yanked a bunch of years out of there, and there's several of the documents that we're pursuing right now to show other changes in the year. So when you see the Hebrew year, ignore it. It's inaccurate. <clears throat> Admittedly inaccurate. And yet, tradition, tradition. You know, we got to have our traditions and we got to go with what we've, you know, the rabbis say it. Um, so there's much being said there. Back to Abraham. So at the feast, I will return to you the toward the time of life and share it so have a son. The, the recorded historical perspective is that Isaac was born right there at Passover season, in exact similitude of the Lord. So that's pretty fun when you see it all laid out that way. So the similitude of the father and the son is in Abraham and Isaac. Okay? Now let's go back to Daniel, Daniel eleven twenty seven, And both kings' hearts shall do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one another, at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So these leaders of the world, one of which probably is the Antichrist and his cohorts, are going to be discussing things. But God says, I got this, and it's got to happen the way I said. Even though there are all kinds of mischief going on, and we know there's all kinds of mischief going on, right? In the world leaders. 
the time appointed, he will come on the Mount of Olivet. I'm having fun trying to get this to click. So, for yet the end shall be at the Moed, <clears throat> at the feast. Let's move two verses later. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So at the time appointed, at the Moed, at the Moed, he shall return at the feast. He shall return. All of which are the same translated words as King James translated. <clears throat> now let's go to Daniel 35. This is a few verses even later. This one's not so fun, but yet it is. And some of them with understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end. Yet, because it is yet for a time appointed. So, he's telling us the fifth seal of Revelation. What's the fifth seal of Revelation? When he opens the fifth seal, it's the seal of the martyred saints. Okay, so this is in parallel to the martyred saints in the fifth seal of Revelation at the time appointed. And king shall do according to his will. So he's saying, some of us of understanding shall fall to purge them and make them white. That's not something we should be afraid of, even though most of us are. Um, we should not be afraid of those things because when I go and sit at the wedding feast, or that's being optimistic, right? I hope when I go and sit at the wedding feast with our Savior that my garments have been made white one way or another. And if it requires so that I can sit next to people like Joseph Smith, and Abinadi, and many of those who have laid their lives down for the cause of truth. I don't know, and I said this last time, I've seen people die in pretty horrific ways. You know, I've seen cancer take them over years and years. I've seen different things happen. I kind of like the idea that my garments may be made white and then I go a little quicker than five years of cancer, maybe, or something. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a chicken, but, uh, you know. Uh, so I don't fear these things. I actually, I actually look at this, and maybe it's easy for me to say now, and the true test will be when right. they point the gun at you, say, <laughs> like they did to Joseph F. I think it was Joseph F. when he was a boy. Are you a Mormon? Have you heard that story? True blue. True blue. Yeah, died in a whole true blue. <laughs> anyway, I hope that I'm as bold as Joseph F. Smith was, or when he was a boy. Go ahead. Yeah, I need to be, I hate to use a Christian term, but I need to be reborn in him type thing. Yeah, I need to be come his. <clears throat> and the kings shall do according to his will, or the king shall do according to his will. We're talking now the king of Assyria, the end time Antichrist character, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. In other words, God's going to allow him to do this until what I talked in our last session, until that midpoint when the abomination of desolations takes place, which is the cleansing particularly of America, Okay, the abomination that takes place and cleanses, he's going to allow him to thrive sufficiently that he can accomplish that. For that determined shall be done. So this is Daniel 11, verse 35 and 36. So we're progressing through Daniel as we're stepping forward here. And the word, for it is yet for a moed, I'm just showing you the word is the same. In all of these scriptural accounts, this, this time referred to is always referred to as the Moedim or the Moed. <clears throat> well, I'm going to go back for just a minute because I want to show you something. Oh, I should have left that back one more. Let's go again because I missed showing you. No, I'm sorry. Get all this taking place. <clears throat> 
Okay, one, this one. Remember I, last time I talked about the seat of Satan in Pergamos? That was the seat of Satan in Pergamos. That was the seat of Jupiter, which was the... <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I usually can. I just maybe need to take a little sip of water. <laughs> I think I have seen it, and yes, it is. And they actually disassembled it, took it to Berlin, then they disassembled it, took it to England, and now they put it back 50 miles away from where it was originally. Was. In, originally in, was. in Turkey? In Turkey. Yeah, and who are they? The, the powers of the world. In essence, Hitler took it to Berlin, then the English took it to the museum in London, and then the Turks complained and said, that's ours, give it back and the English gave it back to the Turks. So the leadership of Turkey. Yeah, the leadership of Turkey complained. So it's actually different stages of leaders of the world that have taken control of the seat of Satan in Pergamos, which is, which is frightful that they want it back. Yeah. Okay, because they obviously... They want our seat of Satan back. Yeah. Of course, they would not call it that. They would call it, you know, the god of the pagan empire, which in, uh, if, you, if you understand the symbology of the Islam and their moon and the stars, it's part of Satan's priesthood. It's, it's, it's just their seat of power. Paganism was, and Islam came through, all of these religions, false religions, and truthfully, the Catholics have been overrun by, but that's a whole other story. The Catholics actually created Islam which way back when, and that's a whole other story to explain all that, but they actually sent in nuns to Muhammad to create the strong arm of Catholicism, and then Catholicism, or excuse me, then Islam got a will of its own, and it became the rebellious son, so to speak, of the Catholics and right. went the way they went. What is Pergamus called today? It's still Pergamus. It's a ruin. Okay, it's not, it's just a ruin of the ancient city of Pergamos now. And I read you that last time, I think, in the book of Revelation. It's no, Turkey on the northern, western area of Turkey. That's why I tend to believe, because of the way it's worded and everything, that the Antichrist will come from Turkey, personally. Um, <clears throat> That doesn't mean there won't be other predecessors that lead up to the final Antichrist. <clears throat> lots of bad people. Yeah, lots of bad people. Anyway, yet for a time appointed. <clears throat> so it's not Obama like some people say? No. I, Obama's just another stooge in a long line of stooges. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the real powers are very invisible, deliberately. They, they don't, and he won't be visible. It says until the end. The scriptures. I have to go with the scripture. And the scripture says he will be made visible, but when that happens, you know we're really close. <laughs> we're really close, folks. <clears throat> okay, Daniel twelve seven. We've moved into the next chapter, but. Personally, sometimes I think chapter breaks, although they're convenient for looking things up, are inconvenient for understanding. Okay, because sometimes we use a chapter break to break thought. And that's sometimes a mistake, because when you're reading in chapter 11, and you read to the last verse of chapter 11, and you see that that's where the Antichrist sits in the temple of God as God, okay, in the end of chapter 11, we have a tendency to break right there and then go into chapter 12, but we shouldn't break. We should just read on. And at that time, when the Antichrist makes his move, Michael stands, blows his trump, and says, okay, three and a half more years. Very clear. When you read through the end of chapter 11 and read through chapter 12, you realize that God's given us a marker that at the abomination of desolation, Michael stands, blows his trump, DNC 88 verses 95 forward for a ways takes place. All these things are taking place right at the Antichrist making his abomination of desolation, the indignation we talked about before, 
and then Michael stands and blows the trump, and the catching up takes place, spoken of in DNC 88. So after he blows, it's three and a half years. Yep. How do we know what that's going to be like? <coughs> Scripture is the best we got. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you some here. <clears throat> Glenn Best asked the same question. Uh, okay, I, I see what you said, and that's all cool. But now what? <laughs> you know, we're going to get there a little bit. Okay. okay. So he's clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and held his right hand as the left hand of the heaven, and swear by him that liveth ever that there shall be a time, a set of feasts, times, two sets of feasts, and a half, three and a half years. Okay. So at the time that this Antichrist, at the end of chapter 11, sits in the temple of God as God, He's done the abomination that does desolate, spoken of by Christ and by many, that we have three and a half years left. So when it shall have accomplished to scatter the powers of holy people, all these shall, shall be finished. So during this time, time, times, and half a time, the Jews are going to be highly tested. Really highly tested. Because... Though that's a time that in Joseph Smith's Matthew, he says, a time of persecution against the Jews like no other. They've had some pretty bad persecution. Okay? If it's like no other, I don't want to watch. Um, I'll give you one thing, though. You ask, what's that time going to be like? The three and a half years? Well, hopefully, DNC 88, verse 95, and there shall be silence in heaven for the space of a half hour, and immediately... After shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unrolled or unfolded. After it is rolled up and the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. So immediately after the half hour of silence, the face of the Lord is unveiled. And the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. And they who have slept in the grave shall come forth. For the grave shall be opened and they shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. So immediately after a half hour of silence, the saints get caught up. And by linking, we know that that is the first verses of Daniel 12. So if you go to Daniel 12. So when is that first the half hour of silence? Before the first three and a half years? Or during? Or the middle? It's the first of the seven. The first three and a half of the seven. Then that's not going to be immediate. Then immediately. Okay. Let me... Yeah, it does. You just gotta, you gotta think it through. Remember, he even said that uh, that could be a week. Immediate. No, no. no Immediate. Right. Just hang on. Let me let me get to this other scripture. Um, the half hour of silence is not twenty-one years. Right. Yes. It could be a week. But it looks like it's. It's three and a half years. Three and a half years. It's the first three and a half years. Yes. Okay, but then here in verse 95 it says that after the space of half an hour and immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be spoken. So I'm trying to reconcile that. Who, who's this guy? The man clothed in linen. Who's the guy? Nope. That's Michael. Okay? I'm, I'm getting to, D and, or to Daniel 12. And I just see when you were having this question, I'm just going to read through it. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book. What verse is that? Uh, verse 1. Okay. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some of them to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting to contempt. And they shall be wise and shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many of the righteous at, for the stars. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is you parallel that with DNC 88, and you know that that's what the Christians want to call the rapture. Okay? And it happens three and a half years before Christ comes. And Revelation 12 says, and the woman is caught into the wilderness. Okay? Eagle's wings, translation. The saints 
They're caught up three and a half years before the bad stuff. Or I mean, be right before the bad stuff. The really bad stuff. The wrath. So what you have is you, you know, many people don't believe that there's a rapture, but there kind of is. It's just not what they say it is. It's a resurrection and a translation. And it happens at the beginning. See, we're at verse 7 here, the man clothed in linen. Back in verse 1, Michael stands, blows his trumps, and the catching up takes place. Then he says there's three and a half years. So what's happening during three and a half years? Is we're in the wilderness, however that looks. Okay? And we're caught up, and we're planning the return three and a half years later to come and Take back the earth. When you say caught up, could it be a, a, a translation? Well, that's exactly what I read yeah. it as. Okay. That the so dead are... trying. A, 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 a terrestrial being here, we're not caught up, we're still here. Caught up may be dimensionally. Okay. Okay, it's dimensionally speaking, probably more than vertical. Yes. Okay, and we're caught up into a translated condition. And that is our eagle's wings that give us the, that power to do what we need to do. So just ascending to a different level. Yes. It's, a, like, it's like we get to ascend early to a terrestrial state. Is that the beginning? Okay, so the immediate then is a no. to the No, that's the three. Exactly. Not the world. Okay, exactly. You've got it. You're getting it right so now. Say it again because we've got too many conversations going. So it's to the saints is what she's saying. The ones that are caught up are to the people that in Revelation, or excuse me, in Daniel 12, 1, it says, the people written and found written in the book. It's the people who are right. sealed up to the first resurrection, the morning of the first resurrection. Okay? We're talking about the morning of the first resurrection here. So Doctrine and Covenants 88 when it says it's immediate uh, after the space of half an hour, that is immediate for the saints that are taken up before the wrath, not immediate to the world. And thus the big misunderstanding yes. that there's two half hours of a silence. Thank you. Okay? Because most people think okay. the one in Revelation and the one in D&C 88 are different. So is that the time when the graves are going to open up? And the yeah, absolutely. For the first fruits. Okay. Remember that word, first fruits? First fruits is a resurrection. In fact, if you read farther in 88, it says first fruits. Okay, if you read farther in 88 right there. <clears throat> verse 98, read it out loud. Now they are Christ, the first fruits. They who shall descend with him first. And they who are on the earth and in their graves who are first caught up to meet him and all this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of God. Which is Michael. Is Michael. I love that. Okay, so you got Michael sounding that trump. The saints are caught up, dimensionally probably, not vertically. Okay, and to them the face of the Lord is unveiled, but not to the rest of the world. Oh, that is good. Okay, so then you understand that the half hour of science you read about in Revelation, and then you hear all this judgment, and you're going... Ooh, I want to miss that. Guess what? You do if you qualify. Okay? You do miss that because you will be... Unaffected. Un well, I'm going to say that the mission of people who are caught up, mm -hmm. the mission of the 144,000, mm -hmm. in their terrestrial state, mm -hmm. is to go out and rescue people as they yes. qualify. That's what Spencer talks about in his yeah. Okay. They are, they are caught up, yes, they are in a terrestrial state. They have power different than the rest of the world. And their mission as the 144,000 is to go out as hunters of men, meaning they, however they discern, in this wrath, which is the worst time the world has ever known. I mean, if you read Revelation, you kind of know what it is. It's kind of scary, right? Yeah. Okay. They are going out during that three and a half years, and when they see somebody that's pure in heart that is maybe repenting during that time, they get to pluck them out and pull them home. Okay, go ahead. Can I just make a request that while you're doing that, would you please look for me? <laughs> I like that. 
Okay. <laughs> so, so when, when you read in Revelation and the half hour of silence goes and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Right? That's where the misconception about two half hours of silence comes from. Because they're saying, well, this is different than 88. But what's different is the people. The saints, just like in Daniel, verse 1 of Daniel 12, Michael sounds his trump. They're on to a different mission. 144,000. Yes, and when you read in Revelation, in that second part, those woes, where the righteous are not there. It refers to exactly. The Thessalonians. They just keep railing against God. It's like the righteous aren't there. No, they're not. It's Thessalonians. And thou art not appointed unto the wrath. So if you qualify in, at the end of the first half of tribulation, you get out of, get out of jail free card. Okay? However, it's with, a, with an assignment because priesthood and gospel is always about blessing ministry. and then ministry. So you don't get out to go sit in the cloud. Okay? <laughs> Play a harp. Okay? <laughs> you know, we're not going to go up there and just, oh boy, sorry guys, this is the life. You know, I'm not, you know, what I'm saying is what you're doing here is you are working to save souls. You're on a mission. You're 144,000 get to go on a mission to save people out of the worst time the world has ever known. I just want to know, when does the first three and a half years start? Because I thought we were there. No. I know. But I love the way, I love the way Mike puts it. We can still shop at Costco. Okay. <laughs> um, so when we can't shop at Costco, that's when it starts? It's a good sign that it's coming, at least. <laughs> of course, next month when they implement the Beast card, they say, you know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, time, time and a half. So this man clothed in linen is Michael. It's him blowing his trump. Daniel 12 is parallel in D.C. 88. Verse 98, what you're seeing is by what you call synchronization, you can see all these events in Scripture lining up. And you got Daniel, or Michael standing and blowing his trump. You have it in Thessalonians. You have it, it's being told to us in all different ways, but they all say the same message. And that is, guess what? You guys get to get out of here. In Thessalonians, it says the same thing. By the sound of the trump of the archangel... They're caught up, and they don't have to go through the wrath, which is that last three and a half years. But it still isn't going to be a cakewalk. We will be sanctified, purified, yeah. tested. So we well, you're going to get back to my chart here pretty soon, and I'm going to go through a little more detail. But if I have my years supply, and if we're going to have three and a half years that we can't shop at Costco before we leave, <laughs> Should I disappoint you? You're a terrestrial being. You don't need the Well, that's then. The first three and a half is the ones you got. Okay. Oh, yeah. Get three and a half years in. Yeah, I was going to say, you know that the original teaching was seven years, just like yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. The original teaching was going to seven years supply, just like in the time of Joseph in Egypt. You say minimum a year supply. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. the year is just, that's just basic, you know, just basic, okay, you, you made it through the the, through some of the transition, but you, no, the, the, the original teaching was seven. Okay. So Moed, Moedim and a half, that's exactly the Hebrew words. So when Michael stands and he raises his right hand and the left hand of the heaven as our patriarchal father, and he says, there'll be a time, Moed, Moedim and a half. Or there'll be a feast, feast and a half, three and a half year cycle. Do you think that will start in the spring or the fall? Spring or fall. That will start in the spring. The tribulation starts in the fall, but the halfway point is the spring. Okay? Habakkuk, for the vision is yet for a time appointed, but the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Surely it 
because surely it will come and it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The word there, obviously, once again, for yet the Moed feast. Yea, also, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. We're talking about the Antichrist here. Neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gather unto him all nation and heapeth unto him all people. This is a very ambitious, I want to be control the world. It's a Hitler type character who has no clinching of his appetite to control the world. He absolutely is driven by passion to control the world going on. <laughs>